Well, good morning. Um, it's great to see everyone. And uh, those watching other parts of the building or online or in Gallup, it's great to connect with you all as well uh, today. So roller coasters, um, what makes them roller coasters is the unexpected. There are turns, there are, are dips, there are, are rises that uh, you, you don't necessarily uh, see coming. And if I were to explain 2020 as a year, we might just call it a roller coaster. And it, it continues to be one that doesn't disappoint. I mean, we started um, uh, 2020 with the idea of maybe being on the brink of war. And, and then we, we added to that this, this, this illness that is from other parts of the world and spreading throughout the world and going to pandemic and lockdowns and masks and layoffs and financial stress and everything that comes with it. Uh, then, uh, albeit for a very brief time, was the idea of murder hornets. And y'all remember those? Um, we're all going to die because of murder hornets. And, and then, you know, we have uh, the, the race protests, the race riots, all of the things that are, are centered around there. And then to kind of top it off, we got snow in September. <laughs> so uh, Farmer's Almanac's already predicted that it's going to be an erratic winter in, in, in much of the United States. And uh, that's kind of to be expected right now. Now, as we've talked about 2020, oftentimes people have used the term, and I've used it a time or two myself, unprecedented times. And, and, and we want to say that the world in which we live in is unprecedented. Now, I don't know that that is necessarily the case. Uh, I think that throughout human history, we could probably look at the fact that there's been pandemics and, and, and different things that are, are happening right now that it's not unprecedented. Uh, I think maybe saying difficult times might be a better way to describe this. Now, we do live in in a difficult time in history. And at least for us, there's things like job stress. There's things like financial stress. There's, uh, I think, an increase right now in domestic violence. There's marriage problems. There's all kinds of things that are bringing in where we would say things are difficult today. Now, there might be Christians throughout the world right now that would look at our difficult times and say, we would love your difficult times. And, and actually, if you go back to the beginning of the church, you go back to the first 250 years of the church, they might look at what we're going through and say, yeah, what you're going through is not difficult at all. You see, in the first 250 years of the church, they said that there were 129 of those years that there were actual edicts by Roman emperors to persecute Christians. So there were times of, of, of peace, but for the most part, it was a time of persecution. And when we talk persecution, we're talking crucifixions, beheadings, coliseums, lions. We're, we're talking massive persecution uh, of Christians. And it wasn't just Christians, but it it included a vast, uh, a really, uh, a amount of people. But Christians were often lumped into that. Also, Christians were highly misunderstood. They, they were actually considered to be irreligious people. And the reason why they were considered to be irreligious people is because they only worshipped one God. And it seemed unusual and strange and irreligious if you only worshipped one God. They were also considered to be immoral. You know why they were immoral? Because they had this view of sexuality that was very narrow when everyone else had a very broad view uh, of sex sexuality and a very permissive view. Uh, they were actually considered to be cannibals. You know why they were considered to be cannibals? Because this strange sort of thing that they went through when they met together, which was called the love feast, today we call it communion, and they felt it strange that people would eat bodies and drink blood. 
And so they were often ostracized. They were often made fun of. They were often fired from their jobs. They, people would not do business with them. Family members would not have anything to do with them when they decided to follow Jesus. I think more persecution will happen to us like that than beheadings and crucifixions and, and different things where people just won't understand us. But Peter, as he was writing the book of 1 Peter, that's where we're going to land today, as he was writing the book of 1 Peter, there just happened to be an emperor in Rome. And his name? Nero. Now, he was a bad dude. He was a bad dude all the way around. You see, he even had his own mother executed because he felt like she was not loyal enough. So it, you, you just go up, uh, up the scale of tyrant to the, to the top floor if you kill your own mom. Okay, so that's who Nero was, but Nero was said that he did not like Rome. He thought it was a hideous city. And so in 64 AD, there was a fire that broke out in Rome, and everybody was under the assumption that Nero did it because he hated the city. And so as he started to get blamed, he decided that he would place the blame on Christians. So they rounded up followers of Jesus, they arrested them, they wrapped them in animal skins, and released wild dogs to devour them. That's who Nero was, and that was the man that was ruling during the time that Peter wrote a letter to a group of churches in, in what today is modern-day Turkey. In fact, we're going to look at this, but I, I believe what Peter is, is doing is he's encouraging the church to live like they're born again, even in difficult circumstances. And, and maybe a message for us today is live like you're born again, even when sometimes life stinks, even when we want to complain about what's going on, Peter might tell us today, live like you're born again. And so we're going to dive into 1 Peter, and there, there's a little bit in the first couple of verses that I'm going to kind of highlight, but I'm going to dig into one particular item here. So let's go ahead and dive in. We're going to start with verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2 of, of 1 Peter, it says, Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter is identifying himself as, as the person who writes this. To those who are elect exiles in the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for, all, uh, and for sprinkling with His blood. It's interesting, just a couple of things I, I want to point out. Uh, in the first two verses, we find Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is mentioned here. Now, a lot of times what people do when, when they go through um, verses like this, these are called salutations, and I'm one of those when I get to a salutation, kind of the opening statements of the apostle as he is getting ready to write his letter. Oftentimes what I'll do is like, ah, I don't need to read that part. I want to get to the meat. But there's a lot of meat right here in this particular uh, instance. In fact, the fact that Peter is writing to the, the cities that he is writing to, we'll, we'll kind of get uh, in, into this in, in 1 Peter. It is clear that the, the church, at least by and large, are Gentile Christians. In other words, they're not Jewish. And, and Peter kind of has a checkered past when it comes to his relationship with Gentile Christians. In like fact, there was a time that Paul uh, the apostle in, from, uh, the, who wrote the book of Galatians talks about a time that, that, that Peter was okay with the Gentile Christians until the Jewish Christians showed up, and then he backed away from them. And he actually called uh, Peter out for, for his racism. But now we find Peter writing a letter to a Gentile church. And this tells me that God can work in people. And somewhere along the way, God changed Peter's mind about Gentiles, where he kind of had a checkered past with them, kind of, uh, it was kind of sketchy as far as how he felt. He has developed a love for them that he now wants to write a letter to them to encourage them how to follow Jesus in difficult times. There's also a, a word here, uh, a big word. It's a, it, it's a word that uh, gives a lot of consternation to a lot of people, and it's the word foreknowledge. 
according to God's foreknowledge. Now, I'm going to throw out an idea, and the idea is that God is omniscient. Now, it's a term that is only given to God. We don't talk about, uh, you know, that a, a person is omniscient unless they think that they're talking about themselves and they think that they're God and all. But God is omniscient, which basically means that He is all-knowing. So He knows everything in the past, He knows everything in the present, but He also knows everything in the future. In fact, I'll even go as far as to say that God is beginning and end at the exact same time. And we are constrained by time, but beginning and end at the exact same time, Alpha and Omega that is ascribed to Jesus. So therefore, He knows everything that will happen into the future. And, and this kind of boggles our minds because we are so finite. In fact, it was David who actually talked about the foreknowledge or the omniscience uh, of God when he wrote Psalm 139. And he said this, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. That's foreknowledge. But then he goes on to say this, he goes, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. And I, I'm going to tell you that there are certain realities of God that I, I, I'm going to say we can't comprehend. We can't comprehend the ways of God. We can't comprehend the knowledge of God, but we can embrace the God who is that. We can accept the God who is that, and we can worship the God who is that. But one of the, 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 the big word that I really want to point out here today is the word exile. Your Bible that you're reading might, might say sojourner, and it's connected with the word elect, and we'll get into elect here in a couple of weeks. But this word exile is so vitally important. I believe that Peter begins with identifying the church as exiles because of what they would have heard when Peter said that word. For example, sojourner means this, a temporary resident who has a deep and abiding allegiance to another sphere. So basically, where you are, your heart and your mind and your allegiance is somewhere else. There's, there's a pull. Now, I'll tell you, I've lived in New Mexico longer than I have lived anywhere else in all my life. It's kind of humbling and kind of eerie when I think about that. And Tara and I came to this realization about this time last year that we've lived here longer than anywhere else that we have ever lived in all of our lives. But there's always something about Kansas that, that draws my attention. There's always something about home that it, it's like there's something about there. Now, what Peter is saying, though, is that our allegiance and our pull is not where we were and not where we're from, but where we are going. That our, our, our temporary residence here, we have to understand is temporary because there's a greater reality. There's a, there's a greater reality that is, is moving forward. And, and I want to talk about that greater reality because it's so easy to get tied up in our own circumstances. So let's just kind of dive in and talk about what that reality is. This is a beautiful picture. It says this in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His uh, great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I want to stop there. There's I think we can spend a long time here, too. He has caused us to be born again. The cause behind this is not what we do, it's what God has done. Born again is new life. It's, it's this, this, this new direction that, that we're going to go in, in life, but he is, we are born again. And the focal point here is into a living hope. The, the idea of, of living hope is that it will not die. We're going to talk about that here in a moment. But a living hope into an inheritance. Now, one of the things we have to understand uh, about an, an inheritance, and we'll get to that, but this is only through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hope is found in no other name than the person of Jesus. We can try to hope in our finances. 
I, I think the difficulties of, of this world remind us that we can't put our, our hope in health, we can't put our hope in things, we can't put our hope in finances, we have to put our hope in something that has staying power. And if you ever received an inheritance of any kind, you might look at that today and say, it is no longer there, or it's no longer what it was. But we have an inheritance, and, and Peter explains what this is, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So let's talk about this inheritance here for a moment. Imperishable. It will never fade. It will never go away. That's the inheritance that we have. It is undefiled. It is beyond the reach of evil. It is unfading. This is actually the idea of a flower that never withers. It's always the same. It's kept in heaven, so therefore it's out of our reach and presently is in heaven, and it is guarded by God. Guarded by God. And you, you talk about Fort Knox, you talk about the, uh, the, the crown jewels uh, of, of the monarchy in England. We always talk about things that uh, we can't attain, we can't uh, get in there because they're guarded so much. Our salvation is more secure than that. Because it's guarded by God and it's kept in heaven. And so Peter, talking about exile, talking about sojourner, temporary residence in this world, life sometimes stinks. Sometimes you've lost your family. Sometimes you've lost your job. You've lost your livelihood. You've been beaten. You've had friends die because of their faith in Jesus. Life stinks. And I believe what he is saying is your current situation does not determine your eternity. What you're going through right now, it's not going to dictate your, your final destination. It doesn't dictate the, the, the end of the story because the end of the story is not here. And the end of the story is determined by Jesus and not by us. And so as he goes on, I, I think one of the things that he, he lets them know, though, is that there are circumstances that are difficult they still matter to God. In fact, I want to share a story with you. I was, it was 1997. 1997, I had just graduated from, uh, with my master's and was going to move to DeKalb, Missouri. I lived in Abilene, Texas. It was 82 degrees on January 2nd when we left Abilene. And within a week, the high in Missouri was nine. And our oldest uh, child, who was the only child we had at the time, never wore a coat before that. And so he was, it was complete culture shock to Zach. And, and so uh, we get there, uh, we're unloading the U-Haul in the church parsonage. Uh, that's the house owned by the church, by the church, and, and so on. So we're loading, unloading into the parsonage, and somebody says, hey, I want to introduce you to this guy. He's our old minister. Uh, he's just hit up here to watch a basketball game tonight. And so I go over, and I introduce myself, and he goes, Hi. And I mean, the look on his face was one of, who the heck are you? And I was like, well, that's just odd. So I'm going to walk away, and a guy by the name of Sam walks up to me and my wife and says, hey, by the way, Dan's really upset that somebody else is moving into his house. And that kind of set the stage for a, a few years that we were there. And in fact, I, there would be times I'd go into elders meetings or leadership meetings, and there would be a problem that we're going through. And before I could say, this is what I think we ought to do, one of them would say, I talked to Dan today. That was the previous minister. I talked to Dan today, and Dan thinks we ought to do. And so, honestly, there was a lot that I loved about the place. Loved, I love the people. We still have great friends there. But I took my lumps there. There were people that did not like me because my name was not Dan. And he had been there for 15 years and, and so on. And uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of things that we went through that I never envisioned I was going to go through in ministry. But I will tell you, I believe that I had to walk through that so that I would be prepared to be a pastor someplace else. So sometimes God takes us through things to prepare us for future things. 
In fact, if you look at verse 6, in verse 6, this is what it says. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. In other words, life stinks sometimes. It really does. But he says, in this you rejoice. Why? Because we know what's going to happen. So that your tested genuineness of faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to be the result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. I'm going to stop there. I love this. Because it tells me that the difficult times that I walk through in life and where I'm asking God, what are you doing and why am I going through this? God is in the midst of that. And I don't have to understand. I don't have to understand other than to know God is up to something. In fact, here's what I believe. God is writing a better story through our difficult moments. That when we're walking through times that are difficult, that are testing our faith, we think, what is wrong? God is refining. God is moving. God is changing. And I I fear that sometimes we want to rob God because we don't want to go through difficult times. We want to rob God of the opportunity to mold us and mature us and change us, to prepare us for eternity because we don't want to go through the discomfort of life. I mean, there's probably not a person alive that just says, you know what, I want a little bit more discomfort. (laughs) There's probably not a person alive that says, you know what, another trial would be great right now. I just haven't had one of these for a while. But the reality is God works through them. And, And I'll even go as far as to say this, we may never know this side of eternity what He's up to, But we have to trust that if his word is correct, that he is using difficult situations to mature us so that we are ready for the day when his son returns. Several years ago, there was a study done. Parents were asked if you could have your children avoid one thing all their life what would it be? You know what the number one answer was? Suffering. Because nobody wants their child to go through difficulty in life. But in doing so, we may be robbing God of the opportunity to mature kids when we try to shield them from suffering. So this is what I know. I know two things. I know a few more, but for today, I know two things. One is this. It's okay to not be okay. There's, there's this, this notion and idea that, that the church has imposed upon the world, and the world believes this, is that they think that they've got to get their, th- their act together in order to go to church. In fact, I was talking to a guy one time. He was actually my son's, uh, my oldest son's first boss, and as I was talking to him, I I, I actually asked him, I said, you know, you're walking through a, t- a tough time right now. Have you thought about what Jesus might be able to do through this? And knowing that he had gone to church in the past and different things like that, he said, you know, I've thought about it, but I need to deal with a couple of things on my own before I get back into church. And the reality is, I believe that that Jesus is saying, and we could look at a lot of stories in Jesus' life where he is saying, you don't have to deal with this on your own. It's okay to be where you are. It's okay to have the baggage that you have. Just walk with me and walk with me through this. And, and the beautiful thing is, it's not as though Jesus is going to leave us where we are. I mean, it's okay for us to have the baggage. It's okay for us to have the mess. But he doesn't want to leave us in the quagmire of that. And so when, when I look at what it says in, in verses 6 and 7 here, the, the beauty of this is this right here, 
What Peter is telling the, the, the church is, listen, you're walking through difficult times, and, and, and there is this greater reality, there's this greater reality of, of heaven that awaits us, but you're walking through this stuff right now, and you're walking through this because God's not done with you. And we have to believe with all of our hearts that if we're walking through difficult times, God's not mad, it's that God's not done that there's still work that he wants to do in our lives. In fact, done is dead or Jesus returns. That's when he completes his work. And so, bottom line, I want you to get is this. No matter what you're walking through, no matter what difficulty you're facing, God's not done with you. He wants your mess. He wants what you consider stuff that he didn't want to deal with. That kind of stuff his son died for. And so, I, I want to show you a promise. It's, it's also from one of those introductory parts of scripture that sometimes we read over because we think, eh, there's probably nothing there. Paul's just saying hi to people as he's writing. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul writes this to the church, and I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus returns. Now, I could preach an entire sermon here, but I'll just give you a few thoughts. God began a work. When you said yes to Jesus, God began a work. I'll even go as far as to say God was working before then. But God began a work. He will continue to do His work. And either when you die or when Jesus returns, His work will be completed. God's not done with you. In fact, one of the things I, I want you to see here, we have to know our place in his story. That's, that's the beautiful thing. We have to know our place in his story. Because when, when, when we enter into a walk and relationship with Jesus, it is no longer my story, it is his but this is the beautiful thing. Notice verse 10, and I don't have this up here. It says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. In other words, prophets that were before you long to look into what is this story going to look like in the future. Angels long to look in to say, what is this story going to look like in the future? Because angels are not omniscient. They don't know the end of the story. But what we are living as followers of Jesus, if you have committed your life to Christ, you are living the grand plan of human history because you're included in the story of God. To me, that makes me like ready to go take on the world because God's invited me to be part of His story. God's invited me to be part of his family. So as we go through 1 Peter, I want to offer a challenge to everyone. Uh, this week and every week, read the book of 1 Peter. Every week, for the next eight weeks, read the book of 1 Peter. Five chapters in 1 Peter, so that means Monday through Friday for some folks. For some of y'all, you like to read a book of the Bible uh, at, in one sitting, this is a book of the Bible to read in one sitting. Write down your questions. Write down your observations. Write down the questions that I probably am not going to answer, and neither is Jim. Okay, because there's a few things in First Peter that Peter knew, God knows, and I kind of go, I don't know. So we're not going to answer all those, but dive in. And also this, if God is continually working in our lives, then we need to make the moments that God is working matter. So we need to make times like this matter, and we need to make downtime matter, and we need 
to, to, to make our, our time in the Word matter. In other words, be expectant of seeing how God moves in your life. Be aware that in moments where you're discouraged, in moments where you don't understand, maybe God is working behind the scenes. Will you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, I thank you for moments. I thank you for moments like these where we can be together as your church, and I thank you that you're not done. You're not done with us, that you are continuing to work and will continue to work until your son returns. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.